kid. Seriously. <laughs> Welcome to the giddy return of the Star Wars in Review podcast. We're the only podcast that's willing to take our chances with two fighters against a Star Destroyer. Over there, it's Luke Neitzel getting crazy with the cheese whiz. Over here, it's Maya Madrid, who is a driver and a winner. Things are going to change. I can feel it. Every so often, we get together to discuss news in the realm of Star Wars, answer some questions that we got from you, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. Give us a like. Give us a, a subscribe. Whatever you do, don't get on our bad side because we have the death sentence on 12 systems. Luke Neitzel, how are you? kind of feel like I'm still suffering through the the death sentence on 12 systems. Cause what do you mean? I, it's, so it's Friday, and normally when we record on Fridays, which normally we do Thursdays, but sometimes we do Fridays when schedules allow, and Fridays I usually have a nice big glass of wine with me while we do this. And that's not the case this week because on Wednesday I was like, I have nothing to do at work tomorrow, and we've had a busy week. So why don't my partner and I, as she likes to be called, just have some drinks and hang out. And then we we had some whiskey sours, and uh, I think we ended up having three or four later, and I was really, really hammered. And I'm like, oh, this is this is fine, because I don't have anything to do at work in the morning. So I got up, and I helped the kids get on the bus, and I'm all hungover, and it's 7.20, and all of a sudden I realized I had a 7.30 meeting that I forgot about. Oops. So I couldn't even shower, just had to throw clothes oh, on, oh and, and go to this meeting that I was still a half an hour late for, and oh. it was a disaster. So I have been recovering from that, and I still still feel the effects a little, but at least it's a holiday weekend. Well, I wish you were doing better than I was. Or, I'm sorry, I wish you were doing better, like me, I should say. No. Oh. Um, four days left of my current job. Cannot wait. Cannot wait to get out of there. Solo's out. Seeing it tomorrow, as you are. Uh, tomorrow, Liverpool versus Madrid. Excited for that. Oh, yeah. Unless Madrid loses, by the time our listeners hear this, they will know, and so I will get flamed. Tomorrow, cooking a roast. Then I'm doing Lefsa with meatballs or, uh, sometime over the weekend. So things are looking up. The best news is that my daughter has learned to ride her bike. I realize oh, nice. that as a seven-year-old, this is kind of late in the game. Um, we missed uh, a year, like, she didn't have a bike. And so this winter, um, she had said, man, I, I really wish that I could, could ride a bike. And I was like, holy crap, she's seven. She should be able to do this. And so we got her a new bike, and we've just been out there. And just through determination, I mean, she had spent, it was a train wreck at first. She was falling all the time. Um, but she's getting the hang of it, and is really proud I don't oh, think shit. that's late. Really? No, I'm. I, I feel like it is. I don't know. Most of, we we have tons of kids in our neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, 50, 60 kids that you see tool and buy or whatever, and I would guess the the majority of them are uh, late kindergarten through first grade. They're mm-hmm. all in that area, which is what she would fall into. So I think she would be on average in our neighborhood. So and maybe that, it just feels like because she started on like training wheels in third grade. And, or I mean, as a three-year-old, sorry. Sure. And then just never, we just never took those steps to, to teach her. And well, so felt they have really to want to stick with it, right. too, you know? If they fall out of interest in doing it, then it doesn't really matter. Well, I think like I've created what, a monster, because she wants to go every day. And that's great, And she though. will not stop. Like, we have to, like, tear her away from it. It's like her love, you know? She feels free when she's out there, just out on her own. So, it's pretty exciting. It was a very dead moment. I don't, I don't get really nostalgic about those sort of things, um... For the first time, I mean, it was fucking awesome. I I think that's one of my happiest memories as a dad is when my my son was able to finally get it down. My daughter is in kindergarten, and she started. She finally started asking this year or this in the last month to try it without her training wheel. So she's not there yet, but we're still working on it. So we haven't gotten there with her, but getting it with my son was after a lot of frustration of the falling and plus your back hurts having to lean down mm-hmm. and hold the stupid bike up or whatever. So. No, I think that's awesome. That's a huge accomplishment. Well, on that note, uh, for all the non-parents out there, we're glad that you got a little bit of taste of what it's like to be a dad. Uh, Let's get to the news. Luke, we're in the last moments before you and I see Solo, a Star Wars story. And for our listeners... 12 hours almost exactly. Is that 12 hours for you? So I might be going a little bit earlier. I'm kind of risking it. I don't know if there are a lot of seats available, but in any event... There's a showing every 15 minutes. Yeah, I think that's be good. why I think I've been be all right. Um, in any event, for our listeners, next week's episode is going to be devoted to a very spoilery review. It'll probably take up the whole episode. 
Uh, we've discussed before the minor miracle that this movie is coming out on time after the production problems between Kathleen Kennedy and the original director's Lord and Miller. An interview with Variety gave more details about what really happened that led to the dismissal and how the change was a welcome one both for the cast and it hints that maybe for the directors as well. In this article, Lawrence Kasdan blames the problems with the movie's tone while Donald Glover seemed eager to call it a miscommunication of vision. One unidentified crew member explained that continual requests for overtime finally made Kathleen Kennedy, quote, blow up, unquote. Some critique Lord Miller for not being invested enough, not caring enough about what the film looked like, and to put it lightly, wasting money. But the article also sheds light on how their ideas were constantly overturned, how they wanted a more original take while Disney wanted to, a, to do a by-the-book account of everyone's favorite smuggler. The cast seemed to think that Ron Howard's arrival was a gift from above while claiming his presence set things on a calming, welcome path to a more efficient shoot. Most interesting to me was how the interview discussed in a slightly spoilery scene that I'm not going to get into, but how George Lucas was brought in uh, to see it and he made a change that stuck in the movie, like an actual change, gave them some insight as to how uh, Han Solo was. A lot of this is rehash, but a couple of questions and new twists have struck, stuck out to me. First, Luke, how much learning on the job and creativity do you think di uh, directors should be awarded on set? And do you think your opinion changes depending on how big the film's budget is? Would you rather have seen the Lord and Miller um, or the Lord and Miller movie, what they were going to do, or what we're going to get with Ron Howard? I think that that question has isn't a cut and dry yes or no. Yeah, I, you know, I, I would agree. With there's you. a lot of layers to it. I mean, it, it depends on what type of project you're working on. You know, how much freedom you get. You know, budget things. Obviously, every movie's going to have a different budget. This is going to have a higher budget than most movies are ever going to have. But it's still you got to work within those constraints that you're given. So whatever the answer is, and I think it's a different answer for every movie and every combo, it's it's a, it's a an answer where the director, or directors in this case, and the producer production company have to have the same answer, and they have to know that going in. And it sounds like they were never on the same page at any point in the making of this. I don't take much away from the cast comments. They're not going to come in and say... It was way better with Lord and Miller. This Ron Howard movie is horrible. You know, I'm so embarrassed to be here. You know, maybe maybe they'll say that, you know, a few years down the road, like Amelia Clark just did about the Terminator movie that she was in a few years oh, back. that was a long time ago. What'd she say? Just not, that, she's, she said. that it was such a horrible production and everyone was miserable that she's glad it bombed and that there aren't sequels because no one wants to go back to that environment. So maybe we'll get some, some more revealing things as we get farther away from the release date of the movie. But nothing they said really jumped out to me. It's all company line things. What did Glover say? Oh, it's just a miscommunication of vision. And, you know, I mean, that's as generic and bland as you can get. And everyone wants to save face. So I, I really, to be 100% honest, I don't care about the Lord and Miller version. I mildly care about the Ron Howard version that I'm going to see tomorrow. This isn't a movie that excited me when they announced it. Nothing they have done has gotten me overly enthusiastic for it. So I'll see this version, and whatever it is, it's, it's fine. I don't need more. So for me, it's kind of like making an album in some respects, and I probably know a lot more about the music industry than I do about the film industry. But, you know, you get certain bands that go into the, the studio, and they write in the studio, they experiment in the studio, and those albums are flipping expensive because they're figuring it all out. And that's what it sounds like Lord and Miller were doing. I think a better way to do it if you want to make a movie like that, regardless of if it's a Star Wars film or another film, is get the cast together and block them out for extra time ahead of time um, so that you can you know, fill in a lot of the gaps sim you know, like similar to the way that a band would get together before they got into the studio, then get the crew in. That's not what happened here. And when you're trying to create something that's costing a lot of money, you have to make sure that it's going to, to hit on all the right notes. And, and what ended up happening is that this movie is going to be hugely expensive because of that, and, um, and a mess because of that. And I just think it's, it's, it's a difficult position to put a, a company in. At the same time, I also think, you know, there's, there's a lot of egg on Kathleen Kennedy's face because you have to, you got to say what you want. Do you want Ryan Johnson to create all this creativity? Then there's no going back. Don't, don't. Don't go back on it. Do you want Lord and Miller to bring what they brought from the Lego movie into the Star Wars universe? Then don't go back from that. I think you were right when you said everybody's got to be on the same page. And I think 
you know, Lord Miller and Kathleen Kennedy weren't on the same page together, but I also don't think Kathleen Kennedy or Disney actually knows what they really want. It's not like Marvel. It's just different. Well, and, and Kathleen Kennedy has now a very long track record of bad director relationships while managing Star Wars. I mean, Josh Trank was fired before his movie even got off the ground. Do you hold that against Kathleen Kennedy? I know that's an example, and I think it's a fair example, but do you hold that one against Kathleen Kennedy? I hold it from the standpoint that maybe you sign someone without really vetting, vetting yeah, who they are and what the, what they were all about. Um, you have the Lord and Miller thing. You have all the rumors about what went down with Gareth Edwards on Rogue One, and you have Colin Trevorrow. So they have. I didn't even think of Colin Trevorrow. Yeah. Well, I the, mean that's just another one that pops up. Exactly. So they have made lots of mistakes, and after a while, you know, you, you can only swing and miss so many times if you're Kathleen Kennedy before you just have a bad batting average. And that's where we are now with her. So it's hard to give her the benefit of the doubt. And if you look at what they've kind of done now, I think everyone would say that Ron Howard was an extremely safe choice. I think everyone would say, regardless of your thoughts on Last Jedi and Force Awakens, that J.J. Abrams is in a very, very safe choice. So they have started to move away from the lesser known independent quantities and are now hiring directors with a little bit more solid track record. And that's probably what we're going to see moving forward now. And, and, and part of me likes that when you're dealing with older characters and part of me wants the Ryan Johnson approach when we deal with new characters, like if like the rogue one style, that's where I want there to be creativity. If they're going to harken back to these old characters that I care about, I would like more, you know, by the book. You know, J.J. Abrams sort of sort of films. Uh, even though now that I think about it, I mean, he changed Han Solo quite a bit in ways that I didn't particularly well, like. And, but... and in the same same instance, you know, who understood those characters better than George Lucas, and he made the prequels. So right, so, <laughs> damned if you do, damned if you don't. Well, I thought you liked the prequels. The fans, our fans, think that you love the prequels. So. What what I think got lost in all of that isn't me saying that I love the prequels and that they're great movies. It's more a comment on how little I think of the force awakens that I like revenge of the Sith more <laughs> yeah, than force there, awakens. One That's thing what it's really the, the course of this entire podcast. If Luke hasn't made that clear to you, dear listeners, he does not like the force awakens. No, I like Revenge of the Sith better, right. and that's where, where all that discussion comes from. But neither of them are, you know, movies that I go, oh, those are really, really, you know, Revenge of the Sith is a really well-made, excellent movie. No one should knock it. I'm never going to say I that. I do like, I like large parts of Revenge of the Sith. But, so do I. Yeah. That's, yeah. It's enjoyable, but it's very, very flawed. So there's the bit in there, and I don't know if you actually, if you read this article or just you're hearing this first from me, but they were talking about how Lord and Miller were getting frustrated because they would go to Kathleen Kennedy and they started getting just shot down on everything, everything that they just asked over and over and over again. And, um, that's, that's something new. I didn't hear about that. I had figured that they had gotten everything that they wanted. They were making the movie that they wanted. And then all of a sudden they were watching the dailies and were like, what the hell is this? In a situation like that, do directors have a responsibility to be professional? Even if the, the production company is telling them no, no, no. To, you know, to keep forging on with what they're supposed to do. We, we heard that they were kind of doing their own thing. They were doing what Disney wanted for, like, the first take and then going off and doing yourself, or doing what they wanted themselves. What are your thoughts on Lord and Miller and how they handled the whole situation? I mean, if, if it's... What's truly happening is you had a creative vision and you agreed on that creative vision, but then once you got into it, they started yanking the rug out from under you. I mean, this is easy for me to say, but... You, you know, artistically, then just walk away. You know, just just get out of it and, and move on and go find a place that is going to let you do what you want to do. I mean, they have enough su success under their belt that they are going to get other movies. Um, and this isn't a Josh Trank, nobody wants to ever see you again type situation. And even Josh Trank will get another movie. Well, he got point. a new series that has oh. Tom Hardy in it. So, well, there we go. Yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, hell, Mel Gibson movies yeah, are nominated right. for Academy Awards. So anyone can can come back in, in Hollywood. Hopefully not Harvey Weinstein, but right. hopefully everyone else can, you know, maybe everyone else can come back. So, yeah, there's probably some things they could have done better. I think this is just a, a situation of blame all around. It yeah. was it was a bad fit, and Kathleen Kennedy should have known better. Lord Miller probably should have known better. Everyone should have come to this conclusion a lot sooner. Yeah. So the last question that I have for you, and I don't even know... If I should ask it, because I don't even know how I feel, which makes me worried, but at the same time, makes me think it might be a good question. 
Is there any bit of you, any part of you at all, that would be wanting or willing to see George Lucas reinvolved any way here after six years of being away from it, from selling it, in sort of a grandfathery, come in with the broad strokes, sort of not obviously not directing things like that, but the broad strokes that I feel that he does really well. Is there any part of you who would like to see him come back in some capacity? Hundred percent, really, hundred percent would. In just the role you said, come up with the overall concepts and designs, and you know, talk about your original intentions for the characters that they can build on or whatever. Just you know, stay the hell away from dialogue. But, yeah, I think his input would be great. And even if you have him in that role, it doesn't mean you have to take everything he says and do everything he says. But he's a part of it. He'll always be a part of it. And I have no problem with his involvement on that kind of large-scale, you know, big-picture scenario because he he's good at that. That's yeah. what he is good at. It's and that's the what, other stuff he's not good at. That's the one, of, one of the things that I've learned most about this going through the Clone Wars, these episodes, and seeing what his role was in the Clone Wars, allowing directors to direct more, allowing writers to write more, and working in that role. I mean, I if you'd asked me six years ago when he sold, I would want nothing to do. I would want George Lucas nothing to do with new Star Wars movies. And now I'm kind of coming full circle. Like, Man, the dude's got some great large strokes, as long as you keep him away from the, the racial overtones of some of the yeah. stuff from the prequels. Um, but there, and I think that would, a lot of people would love that. I think they'd get a lot of people on board. He reminds me a lot of Stephen King, and I don't know if you've read much or any of Stephen King, but... Things scare me like that, dude, you know? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Well, I've read four Stephen King books, and I will say with great confidence that he comes up with just awesome concepts. He is a shit writer, and he can't think of an ending to save his life. And when you see the It movie that Andy Muschietti made that came out recently, Stanley Kubrick Shining, people who take his concepts and are able to make it into a tighter, better story, uh, more cohesive, you get some really, really great work. And none of that work would exist without King coming up with a great concept. But I don't want to read anything that he is 100% in control of because he's just not capable of doing that in what I've seen of him. True. And I think the same of Lucas. Like, you know, well, A New Hope. Um, is definitely definitely the exception, but then again, there's all the talk about did he have his his over? wife saving what was a disaster of a movie, and you know, then you look the universally thought of as the best one is Empire, which is you know him producing and guiding, but Irving Kirshner having a backbone and saying no, we're going to do these things, and Carrie Fisher changing the dialogue, and that's that's where Lucas needs to be, and if they can find a place for him where he would want to do that, I think that would be great. He seems to me, and it's been some time, so maybe he's he's calmed down a little bit, but man, he sure sounded bitter um, yeah. that they didn't want his ideas uh, from the get-go. So maybe for him, just mentally, it's better for him to be farther removed from it because he seems, in some of the interviews I saw, not not like a mentally happy guy with the decisions he made to sell that at the time. So, yeah. But... Interesting. Interestingly enough, he comes on set. You know, Ron Howard, what I think is a personal friend of his, oh, yeah. um, you know, is hired to direct, and so it, it. I don't know. It seems like it could be a really awesome thing to just have him involved in some way. I think you get a lot of people who um, are bitching about Star Wars movie to shut the hell up. Well, you know, Ron Howard was in American Graffiti. Right. Uh, I believe Lucas Lucas had some involvement in Willow. I don't know if he produced he it or created it. Some, yeah. Something like that. And what Ron Howard recently said was that Lucas approached him to direct The Phantom Menace, right. and he turned it down, which, man. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh could I have, mean, I, it would have, it could have been big, worse. Ron, yeah, you're not a big Ron Howard guy, but he's, he would have been really good at... I don't dislike Ron Howard. True. I think he's made some very quality movies. He just doesn't blow me away. True. Uh, I, he doesn't have a movie I really love, but he has movies that are good. You're you talking about this and us hopping around here in the Lucas... Uh, the Lucas catalog made me think I I have read a ton when I was a kid I loved Indiana Jones and I read a ton of Indiana Jones books and I'm wondering if you know the answer to this question what sort of involvement did he have in Indiana Jones like how much was Spielberg how much was Lucas what was do you know anything about the relationship there um, not a hundred percent I mean I think Lucas gets I believe he gets the primary writing credits on them but I think there is a lot of 
obviously Spielberg gets to have a lot of inputs on how things go and change things around. And I think you saw a really good combination of personalities. They're very close friends and you have, you know, Lucas's great concepts and a much more able director able to handle them and get better performances. And, you know, you look at Harrison Ford in A New Hope and then you look at Harrison Ford in Raiders of the Lost Ark and you get completely different performances because you have a director who's a lot better. I don't know if that's fair. Like, like, I guess I would disagree with you on that. Like, Harrison Ford in A New Hope, to me, seems like the guy in the movie who's looking around being like, man, what the hell kind of movie am I in right now? Like, he seems like the one guy who's actually giving a good performance, in my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe I just always thought he was so badass when I was a kid. Um, but he seems like the guy who knows what he's doing and everybody else, you know, the oh. carpenter knows what he's doing and everybody else is confused. I don't know. Maybe oh, I'll see, just... and I always think of that as Al Guinness, who looks like, well, yeah, he's, who, yeah. you know, for, from all accounts was sitting there going, what the hell am I doing here with these people? And this is terrible. But I, I don't think any of the main cast other than Alec Guinness and James Earl Jones, I'm going to say gave a, and, and Peter Cushing, I'll give those three good performances. The rest I will not. He is, Harrison Ford is certainly better than Mark Hamill is. In that movie, but I think he's also Harrison Ford's also playing Harrison Ford too. Yeah, well, a certain extent. I think there, Harrison which... Ford is Han Solo in some respects. Yeah, which always makes me laugh because Harrison Ford doesn't like the character Han Solo. So, no, I, uh, I don't think it's that Harrison Ford doesn't like the character of Han Solo. I think he doesn't like Star Wars fans. Yeah, I, I think that's. I think we're all seeing with with Twitter kind of what he's been getting at. Yeah, yeah, I think he wanted to be remembered for something else. And... Well, Indiana Jones. I mean, that's the one he seems to really love. Man, I really hope that the next one is good. Indiana Jones? One. Yeah. I hate that movie more than I hate any prequel or any... Yeah, it's bad. It's real yeah. bad. But they seem to have learned, hopefully. So, we'll see what, we'll we'll see what see. happens. We'll find out. Hey, the other uh, news notes that we have regard episode 9... Latest You're week. skipping a big story, then. I, I'm i sorry, man. Right. I've had well, kind of a busy week. Right? Why don't you, I let you why get off my shit? Why don't you go maybe you can bring the you, news you can go next. Go. Bitching about... You know, I always give you so much credit for the editing of this show. And I make one mistake, and you're all up in my shit. Well, you, you give your juicy little tidbit, and then I'll drop the real news. Episode 9, rumors. Uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn could make an appearance. Mara Jade could be the mother of Rey. And the movie could start off with a funeral scene that they should have had for Han Solo. Luke, how much fan service do you think the movie is going to end up with? Would including Thrawn, Jade, and that uh, the uh, the makeup for Han Solo make the internet happy? More importantly, would it make you happy to see any of those three, all of those three? What do you want in Episode Nine? I, I want them to make a movie not based on fan service. I want them to make a movie that they think is a good movie and where they they want to take the story so to throw in these elements for only the reason to satisfy the internet i think is a bad idea because it's impossible to satisfy the internet i, I just meant like fans. oh it's kind of the throw on yeah i i uh i don't i think we're too far away removed to need a han solo funeral especially since you know leia's probably going to be dead or die very quickly into the movie anyway and you know so you'll have had the two other major characters die after solo and then you're gonna have a funeral for solo and no 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 that's that's not what I, I i almost feel like we should cut this and restart it because if, oh. I, if i if that's the way that i wrote the question that's what you got out of it i thought you said they were having a funeral for no that's the, the, having a funeral for leia that they should have had for han solo and all oh that. okay i gotcha yeah, i uh that's so fine. you threw me with you Wh- bringing the news and i'm more interested in what you're gonna talk about now then apparently this question, so just hurry up with this goddamn question, let's get to the good uh, one. I would love to see Th- Thrawn, I don't really care if Mara Jade is in there, I don't want Rey to have legacy parents, yeah. I like the idea of her being her own person that came from nothing. Uh, Thrawn's awesome, definitely throw him in there, but have real stories to tell, don't just put these people in there so that everyone can go, hey, I know that person, I read that book. I, I agree wholeheartedly, if you should have, if you were going to put Mara Jade in it, it should have been The Last Jedi, and that could have been one of the reasons that Luke was so just fuck everything. And that would have been the moment to bring her in. I don't want to see it now. I, I, I am at peace and at rest with the idea that Ray's parents are nothing because that's what's best for her character. So, all right, let's get to your news. Well, that they signed James Mangold, the director of Logan and walk the line to oh, make a Boba Fett movie. movie. Yeah. I, I don't give a shit about the Boba Fett movie. I saw that and it completely didn't register. Um, because uh, I don't give a shit about a Boba Fett movie. However, 
they got a great guy to do it. Are they going to let him do his thing now? This brings it full circle to the beginning of our talk because when Mangold gets to do his own thing, you get Logan. When the production company gets to, own, gets to do its thing, you get the Wolverine, which I we actually both liked, but was... See, I think they will because I don't think Kathleen Kennedy is equipped or wants to be the person who says your story will go in this direction and will have these parameters. Yeah. I think she's just going to say, I'm going to be more careful about the people I choose to do this and make sure they're a little more proven. I am not excited for a Bubba Fett movie no, no. either, but my one hope, I had this dream idea for a Bubba Fett movie where it would star Jermaine Clement from Flight of the Concords as Bubba Fett, which works because he's New Zealand. He's from New Zealand, just like the original actor. And that it would be directed by Christopher Guest, and it would be like a mockumentary style of <laughs> Boba Fett trying to capture people in Epsley. Like, I think that would have been just an he awesome. He is completely worthless, right? I mean, like, when you go back and you actually watch the movie, he looks cool as hell. He sounds cool as hell, but he is a terrible bounty hunter. Are we agreed on this? Well, yeah, I mean, he's not in the movie very long. Oh. You know, he, he's, he's on... If we're going by original cuts, he is... On the, the deck with the other bounty hunters, then he follows them through the trash, and then tells the Empire, and the Empire captures them, and then he very unceremoniously gets his jetpack knocked into the Sarlacc. I mean, so for as revered a character as he is among fans, he, yeah, he's accomplished nothing, and I feel like his backstory is pretty, we have a pretty good idea of what his backstory is. We got him as a little kid in the prequels. We get him as an even older kid in the Clone Wars down the road. I'm not, I don't really think it's a territory we need to explore, but I think what they have targeted with Solo and stuff is, and Obi-Wan movies and stuff is that they're, they're not quite ready to just make a complete independent movie in the Star Wars universe away from the main characters. They still need to keep it connected. And until they, they cut that cord, we're just going to keep getting stuff like this. Yeah. I think Ryan Johnson's trilogy will be different. And that's one. Even though, obviously, if you listen to this podcast, you know my feelings about The Last Jedi. But I think with a new story that is his and that he can do, I think a lot of people's angst towards him is going to fade away. Um, I I think you're right. I don't think they're ever going to get rid of these links. I mean, we'll have a Lobot, you know, (laughs) trilogy eventually. But yeah, I agree. Let's talk about uh, emails that we got. You're going to handle it today. It wasn't an email, it was a tweet. Yeah, so, and this is uh, from our buddy Chris in St. Paul, via or Red Wing via St. Paul, and he writes us with a non-Star Wars question, which That's is okay. always welcome, yep. because we are both fans of Alan Moore and David Gibbons' classic, yes. classic work, The Watchmen, and it is being made into an HBO series by Damon Lindelof, who did Lost and The Leftovers and Prometheus, <laughs> and... Some of the interviews that he had put out have talked about how basically this is in the Watchmen universe, but it's not really dealing with the Watchmen story and not dealing with a lot. We don't know if it's dealing with those characters at all. Some of the cast listings are in like Oklahoma City, it mm-hmm. sounded like. So his question is, is what are your thoughts on this? Like what what is happening here, basically? So I loved the Watchmen comic book. I was introduced to it in the summer of 1999. I read the entirety of it in one setting. There is no other comic book that I that I revere more. There's no comic book writer that I care about more. Um, this is the story that that I like, um, that I love. It's 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 my comic book of choice. I, I thought Zack Snyder did a pretty good job uh, in the movie. I was just super excited for that movie. There were things that that really upset me, and one part that that really aggravated me. You um, should tell people what it is, though, because it's not a plot point. It's not a plot point. Um, they they don't they don't mention my favorite line. There's a there's a yeah. there's a part in it where Rorschach is talking about um, how he he uh, I think it was it was the 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 kidnap the kidnapper of a little girl who killed this little girl fed him to uh, fed her to his dogs. And he uh, handcuffs him to the basement and basically gives him a saw and says, I'm going to burn the building down and, you know, you can saw off your arm and try to get out. And there's Rorschach 
standing away from the building and saying, you know, it was Walter Kovacs that closed his eyes. It was Rorschach who opened them again, which is my favorite line in the entire book. And it was coming, it was perfectly set up in the movie, and then they flubbed it. And I cared more about that than the evil space alien at the end um, that, uh, that they didn't I, I show. I actually so. think it makes more sense the way Zack Snyder yeah, did yeah, it. That's fine. But yeah. uh, as far, no, not the line, the space alien. Oh. The squid. I actually think it may, making it look like Dr. Manhattan is the villain it makes actually a little bit more sense because it gives a reason for why Dr. Manhattan would be like, yeah, I have to leave then. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think that's fair. So, it, it, yeah, but anyway, we're sidetracked. But. We are sidetracked. Um, so I'm not, I don't want to end up in a situation where, again, I'm one of those old people who's like, don't mess with the things that I love, you know. I don't think that there needs to be a story in this universe. I am interested somewhat in finding out more about, like, Night Owl and, um, and Rorschach especially those two characters when they were younger, um, younger superheroes. Uh, but I just, I don't think that, I, I didn't like it when DC started writing more stories about it. I know Alan Moore doesn't want them to keep going. I just want to let it be and let it stand on its own. What are you thinking about this? I, I'll give it a try. Damon Lindelhoff is hated by a lot of people out there, especially on the internet. Season two and three of The Leftovers are some of the best TV I've ever seen. Probably in my top top three, top five, top three shows of all time, those two seasons. And interestingly enough, in that show, it's based on a book by Tom Peralta, and the first season is Tom Peralta's entire book series, and that season's pretty bad. And then season two and three, they ran out of that material, so Damon Lindelof just wrote his own thing in that universe, and it's amazing. And I, I absolutely love it. So... I'm able to look at it through those eyes a little bit. I'm also a person who is very easy to say, okay, dabble in it, and if it sucks, I just will stop watching it, and I'll forget it exists. To me, there's one Matrix movie, because I didn't like the other two, so I just don't care about them, and I don't keep them in my brain's continuity. So give it a whirl, because it is a pretty cool, fascinating world that you could set up, and obviously there had to have been a lot more superheroes that we don't know about that were affected by the Registration Act in this universe that you could explore and see what's going on. So I think there is a a pretty big playing field to make new characters and see where things go, and if they completely bomb it, then I'll turn it off after three episodes and move on to the next thing. I think it would break my heart to do that to the Watchmen. You know, I mean, if there's something out there... I'm going to have to watch all of it. I'm going to have to give it all of its time. And if it sucks, I'm going to be very pissed. I will say I really like Lost. I know a lot of people are super pissed off at that show. It's one of my top five favorites. I love uh, the characters of Jack and Sawyer and what happened to them over the course of the entirety of that story. I think it was a masterfully done, yes, uh, what the fuck about the polar bears, but I don't give a shit about the polar bears, and I'm sorry that all of you do. Um, I know that there's questions about the smoke monster. Get over it. That story was about more than the smoke monster. So um, I am looking forward to that portion of it, but I don't want this to be made. Should we talk about the Clone Wars? Let's do it. Season 1, Episode 17, Blue Shadow Virus. Fear is a disease. Hope is the only cure. I suppose there is a disease in this, so maybe it makes sense. You're giving it a lot of credit right now. This episode was directed by Giancarlo Volpe and written by Craig Teatley and chronicles the attempts by Padme Amidala to get back to Naboo in a time of invasion. But there's something new here as a virus is spreading and threatening the life on Maya's favorite planet in the Star Wars universe, Naboo! Luke, tell us more. So as you mentioned, this is an episode that takes place entirely on Naboo. I love Naboo. I think it's the first time we've been there for more than maybe a quick cutaway. And it starts out in the opening narration where the Naboo have found three battle droids that they have captured. Well, they've killed or dismantled. And they are panicked that this means a full invasion is about to happen because they, right now, the war is not affecting them on their planet. So they're worried that this means it's an invasion. And Naboo being a pretty key planet, it's the place that the Chancellor of the whole Republic is from. It's where the war started, basically. All these things, since it's of such prime importance and this is a big worry, 
the Republic smartly sends the three most capable people. <laughs> I knew this is where it, this is going. It could handle <laughs> this because it is time for the wacky adventures of C-3PO, Jar Jar, and constantly captured Padme, as they are the ones that get sent there to deal with this. They go and land on Naboo. They talk to the Queen, who and uh, is a General Typhus. I can't remember what his name. Eye a patch. terrible name. <laughs> Eye patch. I always want to. Call, I always. I always think Typhoid Mary when they say his yeah. name in the movies. But Eye patch security guard guy, and they believe uh, that they are about to be invaded. Um, almost immediately, I noticed the shadowing was different in this, um, and that's Volpe and his his directing. This is, and we'll talk more about it later. The most visually stunning episode that we've seen thus far, and you can tell already there's just something different about the way that he uses shadows in the characters that gives them a different look um, and the way that he uses brightness and darkness um, that I thought right off the bat was was extremely interesting and throughout the course of the, the episode just gets better. So then they go and decide they're going to basically hack into these droids. So they take them into a room so they can try and access their memory bank. And this is, again, I think a pretty good use of C-3PO if you're going to have him in there. Because what they do is they reanimate one of the droids but without its sight and then C-3PO tells him that he's another battle droid and he's there to debrief him as part of the Separatist mission. And they learn that the droid basically is part of a secret mission involving a disease and that they can't let the Naboo know that they're there. Now, as is obviously going to happen, Jar 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 Jar's his way through things and ends up knocking a bunch of racking onto the droid and destroying him. Before we get too far into Jar Jar, I want to talk a little bit. The, the last episode chronologically that we saw, the Rebels, I mean the Alliance, I mean the Republic, um, uses a droid to hack into it to get the information. And I realized that that was actually, that episode was created long before and that was shown out of order. But this is the same damn thing. Okay? <laughs> it's the exact same thing. Like, I was like, same is that droid design, too, which is, is it a the new. Same droid? Yeah, which, no, it's a different droid, okay. but it's the same droid design, which is not a droid we saw in the prequels. Mm. And we've just seen in these two episodes where they need to hack into something. Right. So I was like, what the hell? Like, wh why not? So I'm sorry. Um, yeah, Jar Jar, the, the fly thing, ruining the episode. This is. I was, the first five minutes, I'm like, this is not off to a good start. So basically what happened is Jar Jar saw in one of the droids they aren't debriefing that there was a, a butterfly or a slug or something that he wanted to eat, so he tries to get it with his tongue, and he ends up knocking down a series of racking that destroy the droid. And they found out from the droid that there is a secret lab that they couldn't get the droid to tell him where it is. But Jar Jar knows exactly, this is Jar Jar's home planet as well, he knows exactly the one place that those blue bugs are found. So they know that there is where the lab is, basically. What region of the, the, the planet it's on. Right. So they're going to go get it. They let the Jedi know um, and ask that the Jedi come to help. So Anakin and Obi-Wan and Ahsoka are dispatched along with Rex and his team to go there. But Padme doesn't want to wait. So her and Jar Jar go out there. And we also see some, I don't know what you call them, Naboo cows basically drinking from a river and they all immediately drop dead. I thought this was badass. I thought this was something that's new. This is a new idea. We haven't seen it in Star Wars before. It was scary. I think if I was a little kid, I would have been terrified. <laughs> but I was really, really worried that there was going to be a love story between the Gungan farmer who is not living underwater and Jar Jar. Like it was like there was a look there and I was like, oh God, no. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was coming too. So who knows? Maybe she'll come back in another no. episode and we'll eventually get that but they go and they meet with her and find out what's happening and find out that something's poisoned in the water and then they go a little farther in and some secret cameras pop out of the ground and they are captured because that's what Padme is here to do in the series is to be captured so that someone can rescue her and they are taken down into the lab of the nefarious Dr. Nuvo Vindi and his German accent real quick we'll get back to the the good doctor um, there's a part in here where Amidala asks for the Jedi. She asks for Obi-Wan and asks for Anakin. Obviously, asking for Anakin makes sense. That's her husband, um, though secret. And But there was a little attention to detail that I really liked. She asks Yoda to bring Obi-Wan because Obi-Wan's going to be well-remembered on Naboo. Don't forget that in Phantom Menace, he was one of the people who led to the liberation of that. And I was like, that's a good touch. That makes sense as to why 
Obi Wan. These are the kind of callbacks that I like. When yeah. Of course, he's a hero on Naboo. Yeah, and so. they mentioned that there's tension between the Naboo and the Gungans, so that's part of the reason they want Obi Wan there. True. Which makes sense. So they come and land, and Anakin immediately freaks out because Padme is captured yet again. Mm. So they dispatch Ahsoka to go try and find where the lab location is. Now, Padme was basically able to tell them the coordinates, so I'm not sure why they just sent Ahsoka to start with. Well, we know why they just sent Ahsoka. First of all, because she's cool. Yes. Second of all, because they could never split up Anakin and Obi-Wan ever. Yeah, that that's true, too. <laughs> they would get nervous without each other. But anyway, back in the lab... We have this doctor, uh, oh Doctor Nuvo. Who yeah, yeah, is, yeah, 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 yeah. I kind of enjoyed that. Actually. I did too. He is he is straight out of Frankenstein. He is Doctor Frankenstein, which with, is... but with a German accent. Which again, with the accents, just just stop, mm -hmm. stop assigning accents to characteristics that negatively define cultures. Uh, but anyway, other than that, I, I really enjoyed him, and he captures them, and he immediately goes Bond villain and yes. explains his whole plan yes! for no That's reason, my favorite part. which was pretty funny. And basically, his deal is, is he has found this disease the blue shadow virus which the universe had eradicated because it's very very deadly but he sees it as they kill the living thing in this disease so he is bringing it back and he's only working with the separatists basically because they'll fund him to do it and the disease is water based so as long as no one drinks the water everyone should be fine but he has found a but... way <laughs> exactly he has found a way to Make it airborne, and he does that by hooking it to electrodes just like a Frankenstein monster and shocking it until it turns into a gas. <laughs> and his plan is basically to put it in these bombs and deliver a bomb to multiple star systems that will spread this disease throughout it. And he has a very, very good line where they talk about... Padme tells him, well, you're going to kill all these people. And he goes, really? Well, all these supposedly superior beings are spreading their disease of war. Maybe they don't deserve to live. And I was kind of like, you know what, guy? <laughs> You're not necessarily that far off in some instances. <laughs> but then he has these weird breakdowns where he goes, yeah, 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 like a bunch of times. He's a ton of fun. Whatever, this, char this character is awesome. This character, um, okay, yes. He looks like uh, Doctor or uh, Mr. Freeze. Yes, he looks like a cross between Mr. Freeze and what's that? Hugo Strange from Batman. And he even has like the little glass helmet. This is a 1940s, 1950s pulp homage. I know you hate that word. Um from our earlier conversations regarding old boy and daredevil, but that's what this episode is. And so well, that's why he has the German accents. That's why it's like Frankenstein. That's why it's so over the top. And, and I didn't start to really get this episode until I really started to think about this character. And at first I hated him. And then I came to love him. But now that the Jedi intercept the lab and what they do is beautiful colors when they arrive on Naboo, Naboo well, if you if you watch this episode when they're coming into land you look at the sunset I love that that planet so much well and I thought of you because they had they're in the the throne room or the the hangar bay and they have all your starships you love yeah, you. <laughs> sitting back there but when they attack the lab they basically blow holes in it and drop straight down they, they drop straight out of like the carriers in an awesome just like and into tunnels and like soka drops yeah. down and lights her lightsaber up immediately and there is great action in these sequences as they're they basically split into different groups and are fighting throughout the tunnels um i love how ahsoka fights underhand with her holds her lightsaber underhand yeah. i don't know why i love that so much but i do it was a return of the destroyer droids um that are featured heavily in phantom menace which we haven't seen a ton of here, which I think are a really cool design, how they roll, and then they have the energy shields, and they're actually a match for Jedi, so it actually has some obstacle they have to face rather than regular battle droids. Obi-Wan goes in and actually takes out a bunch of them because he drops the, the roof on him, saving Ahsoka. Anakin goes to find Padme, because that's all he cares about in this, and he finds her where she's captured, because she always is, and the good doctor has hooked her up to the electrode machine, so he just starts shocking her, being like, well, you can stop me and get the virus, but she's going to die while this is happening, which was great. So he cho he, he gives up and chooses to try and help uh, Ab, Padme, and they end up chasing through. There's a lot of, well, I'm going to bust this vial and let the disease go, so there's a lot of the Jedi having to like dramatically catch things, like vials of things as they're falling down. It culminates with Nuvo trying to escape on... Uh, a platform that's raising. It has a starship on it. Once it gets to the top, he can take off. Why can't you just take off? Wait, what is I have it no doesn't idea, matter. It doesn't matter. The same reason Obi-Wan couldn't use the Force to grab all these vials that right. are constantly falling. But uh, we don't worry about that. They're they're chasing after him. It, it's, it's some good battle sequences. He gets to the top. He's about to escape. 
and the farming Gungan. Lady who's Jar Jar. Pe- Peppy Bao. Oh, that's right. Peppy, Peppy Bao, Bao, which if you ever watch the dollop or listen to the dollop, it made me think of Papa Bawa from the ghost episode. So go find that right away <laughs> if you haven't. But she ends up knocking him out and stopping him. And they they're, they manage to catch all the disease, disarm all the, the bombs with the disease that we know of. And uh, they were kind of wrap wrap it up at the end, capturing him. Real quick, I just want to make a side note. If you go back and you watch this episode when um, Doctor Evil Frankenstein guy arms all the bombs, it looks exactly how it does in the Last Jedi when they have like the new version of the B wings. Yeah. And so I was like, that is a great callback that I didn't understand from Last Jedi until now. So props to Ryan Johnson. I know I've been critical of him. Props to Ryan Johnson for giving a callback that I. N- I didn't see anybody notice until now. So this episode is a real combination for me of really good and really bad. It opens horribly, as we mentioned, with the Jar Jar antics and Padme being a victim constantly, which is getting really insufferable. Mm-hmm. They have not given her, minus the movie, they, which is just terrible, and her being in it doesn't really make sense. It was an extra 20 minutes. She has only been used as motivation for male characters to save her. And it's getting real frustrating that they keep doing this. The action sequences and the colors are fabulous. Doctor Doctor Nuvo is awesome. I hope we get more characters like him. This was a real strong showing from Ahsoka, who's one of my favorites. And it's a weird balance that you have one female character that seems to get a really strong and great representation and one female character that's just a tool for men to, to do things. So I wish they would, they would work on that. I know at some point they have to give her an episode where she's more than this but we still haven't seen it. So this is a real mixed bag for me. There are certainly worse episodes than this one, but I can't put it with the great episodes, even though I really like lots of it. And I I would take issue visually. I think uh, I'm still going with our our snow planet. Yeah. That one is, that's the visual one that blows me away. I can't remember what that episode was called. It was episode 15. Um, But it is. Episode 15 is my favorite trespass. Yeah, trespass. So uh, vi- visually, that's the best one. But this one is excellent. Once they, once they get in the lab and are fighting, the fights through these kind of tubular hallways is outstanding. Okay, we know that Jar Jar is in this. We know what's coming with Padme. I don't think it's going to get better. And so I can either hate the series right now, one season in, or I can grade this shit on a curve. And that's what I've chosen to do here. I know that Padme is going to be like that. I'm happy that we got Ahsoka. I think when this was written, was it 2007, 2008? somewhere in there it is going to be what it's going to be dude and so i have to kind of look past some of it in my opinion this is more visually stunning than trespass uh i thought the shadows the different tastes of naboo at different times of day was even better than you know the phantom menace what they they did visually with phantom menace uh the changes in the exterior when they were in the laboratory like that orange tunnel was just awesome i love that villain um i love everything about him i i shouldn't love the accent but it's so, like, Superman, Max Fleischman cartoony that it's just, I just love it. Um, it's all action. It's all adventure. All the characters that I wanted to see, and there, there were tons of things I wanted to see. I wanted to see more Ahsoka. That's what I got. I want to see more original creations like the Stalker. That's what I got. I want to see things that make me care more about Anakin and Padme. And there is not a lot there. We've had two episodes now where they are, like, a couple. And the first one was a joke. And the second one... Not a lot, but the moments when they're actually talking together, I actually, for the first time in my life, felt that there was some sort of connection between those two characters, and I and that's enough for me because that's a start. Um, and I want adventure. This this was the most Star Warsy episode out of the the series so far. So as far as where I rank it, um, I think you're going to be disappointed in me. I have it as number five. Yeah, this is this is uh, two pews for me, and I I it had to fight really hard to get that Mm -hmm. because the things it does that I don't like are the the things that I hate the most about star Wars, what they're doing to Padme, the, the racial stereotypical accents, Jar Jar's buffoonery. Those are things that I just can't stand. And I know I can get good visuals in a coherent and fun story like rookies or like, uh, my my favorite episode is actually the the one where they they fight Ventress, um, it, it, the with the the traitor that she ends up murdering when we had a, another Jedi crash. Yeah, Jedi crash, or no, not Jedi crash, but 
But anyway, there are there are episodes where the things I really like about this ep- that this episode they've accomplished without all the things I really really hate right. about what they do, and that's why I can't give this credit. And I, for one, am not going to forgive the series if it continues to treat Padme like this. I'm not going to relinquish and say, well, that's just how it is. I'm going to continue to bash episodes that do that to their female characters. That's fine. No, I'm I, think gonna... it, I think it deserves to be bashed. I'm just saying if the entire series is like that and that's the line of demarcation that you choose, um, which is completely fair, like I think a lot of this series is going to be ruined. Hopefully it gets better. I'm not I'm not optimistic. And and you're right, that could that could happen, but that's that's my gun I'm sticking to. I'm not no, not going to stand by and give that. that a pass. They should have bits. I don't, I don't care. They... Pass. I'm just saying, like this is Star Wars on some level, and yeah, and that's what pisses me off though, because yeah. I think you have one of the greatest female characters. I mean, one of the things we've talked about is some great female characters that they've come up with throughout the years. I mean, Pr- Princess be the best. Princess Leia is yeah. you know amazing. Jyn Erso is amazing. Ahsoka is amazing. There are they know how to do this right, and they're refusing to do it with her, and. Lucas didn't do it to the extent that they're doing it to her in his movies. Mm. Um, obviously, she was captured in Attack of the Clones. Everyone was captured, though. Yeah, exactly. And she wasn't the first one captured. Obi-Wan was captured before her. So she she never came across as a victim to be saved in those movies to me. And that's all she's been here. And yeah. I, I really hate that. All right, well, so we have it as number five on Maya's list and two pews from Mr. Neitzel. Technically, they're from Laura Dern. Two pews from Laura Dern via Luke Neitzel. Let's talk about other nerd news. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. Luke, what you got? So I have sad news on this front. I watched Fahrenheit 451. It's not good. No. It was really, really disappointing. No. It, it it has some moments and things that are, are good, and it has great performances from the two fantastic leads in Michael B. Jordan and Michael Shannon. But, man, it feels like it's on fast forward half the time. It, it feels like they had to skim everything but didn't want to drop things. It You just never really felt like you were in that world or that you were learning much about these characters and that was that was really disappointing to me so i followed that up on hbo by rediscovering one of my favorite like comfort movies that i'd kind of forgotten about but is one i could watch endlessly and pick up anywhere in and still get enjoyment out of and that is edgar wright's criminally underrated scott pilgrim versus the world which i've never read the comic so i don't know if it's even close to what the comic is but that movie is just so much fun. It's a great use of Michael Sarah without having Michael Sarah be the same character, being George Michael Bluth mm. or super bad guy. Like it's it's a different Michael Sarah, but it still utilizes his strength. There's a million different celebrities. His in strength it. and his weakness. You mean? Yeah, yeah. The video game aesthetic is done perfectly. Uh, it's just a really really fun time, and you don't have to think. I mean, the movie doesn't have as much depth as it likes to believe it kind of does, but you don't really care because it's just such a good time. I uh, I watched that movie with I, I worked at a a, a place uh, for like a like a social services center that had a youth program for uh, the Hispanic population in in southeast Wisconsin. We watched that movie at the youth program, and the kids made me turn it off. They fucking hated that movie. I could I could see <laughs> so, it being a love or hate movie. It, yeah. I, I, I need to maybe rewatch it, but I, I, I don't have a good opinion of it. I so put much. it in the same category as um, Zoolander. Like, okay. I just have such a I fun time, Zoolander. no matter what happens, and I could rewatch it endlessly. And yeah, for me, I got ESPN Plus. I have ended the MLS boycott, which lasted what three years. I don't think it's really a boycott if it they're refusing to give you their service. <laughs> no, it's a boycott. I think they were boycotting just, you I, I, by blacking I you out. Boycott. I ended the boycott. Uh, it's the return of Maya Madrid to his natural home, to the MLS universe. Here's the problem. Everything's changed. Holy shit. All the teams are different now. I got a lot of work to do. I'm wondering, is too many teams a problem? Is, is this league getting too big now with FC Cincinnati about to get a league or a team? It seems like every town's getting a team. And what am I going to do with the Ricketts, Torpedo, the Chicago Fire? Where do I go from here? First off, no. MLS has, as far as 
too many teams. MLS has more talent available to it than any other sports league in North America. Right. There is such a massive player pool that we can pull from because this is the main sport in most of the world. So we get players from South and Central America. And it's fast becoming the main sport in the United States, right? Sure. And in, you know, we can we can pull all these players from South and Central America that want to get more recognition on their way to hopefully Europe or maybe just to carve out a career there where they can get more recognition with their national team. There is a massive player pool to pull from. And what they have done mostly in their expansion is to look at cities like Cincinnati where... Soccer in the minor leagues is a massive major thing, and they're promoting those teams. I mean, Cincinnati sells out 40,000 seats. So they're they're picking markets not just because of the, the television ratings. Now, that being said, they are giving Miami another go with, with Beckham, and I don't think that's based on Miami demonstrating that it wants to be a soccer market. It's based on dollars and, and Beckham. Well, it's based on a promise. Yeah. They, I mean, they have to. Yeah. But, well, they don't have to put it in Miami. No. But... <laughs> Do they not? There, There is enough. No, he, he just got to be in part of a franchise. But there is enough talent to sustain many more teams. That part about it I don't worry. And I, I think you would be someone who could really agree that if you look back to 2000, you know, 98, 2006, to watch games today and say oh, that so the different. talent level is watered oh down God. in comparison. No, I, yeah. I, I didn't mean talent level. I just mean meant... Um, uh, saturation as far as the television markets look i watched a game the first half between fc dallas today and toronto fc the way that fc dallas plays is better than any team i saw in 2006 and they are fourth I, they may have changed now because i think they won tonight but they they were fourth they're tied for league. second now and okay well in the in the west right and, and second, nobody which... literally nobody else has played except for i mean uh, san jose and, and la played tonight the the talent level is so much more i guess i this is going to bring up another question I want to hit, um, but I, I'm worried about like the saturation of the market. Maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe this is all about fans in their hometowns going to the games. Maybe the TV doesn't matter as much. Maybe we need to think about other markets, or, or, or I'm sorry, marketing different than we think about it in other sports leagues. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, if you don't think that there's a lot, look, they, they had too many teams at the beginning. That's why Miami folded. That's why um, Tampa Bay, you know, folded. Maybe it's different now. I mean, our team is making money. This is something that was different three years ago. Nobody's making money. Are they making money now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's you know, look at the attendance around the league. I mean, it outdraws most of the other professional leagues that we have in here, and not soccer leagues. Like, it outdraws the NHL and the NBA in attendance. Now they have some bigger stadiums. I mean, if you put a, a 40,000 seats stadium in for the Toronto Maple Leafs, 40,000 people would go. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not exactly apples to apples, but it draws well. Local markets, for the most place, do well with their television ratings. The national television ratings on ESPN and Fox are terrible. People don't tune into those. But Maybe because they're going to the games that they really care about the league. You know? Yeah, yeah. And you'd still hope you could draw in more casual fans than bowling and softball tournaments that outdraw MLS on ESPN. But the league isn't going anywhere. The teams aren't going anywhere. There's more people trying to get in. It's in a really good place. It's in as great a place as it's ever been, and there doesn't really seem to be an end. About about that, who watches who watches MLS? I'm sorry, who watches ESPN and Fox Sports? Demographically, who watches it? Old people, right? So I mean that. Does, I mean maybe maybe I'm thinking all wrong on this. I mean I think. All the, the people who seem to be in soccer, into soccer, are much younger, and those people don't, you know, they're cord cutters, and maybe this ESPN Plus is really going to help, I don't know. But yeah. what about, I want to talk about the mo the major thing, dude, the Ricketts, they want to obviously buy the Chicago Fire. I'm a Cubs fan. This has worked out well for me. The Ricketts buying the Fire would work out well for me, but they don't want to sell. The Fire doesn't want to sell. There's all this thought that they might torpedo the Fire. Um What's going to happen? You, you just tell me what's going to happen and what I do with the fire go under, right? Just, I, just they're not going to go under. They would get... I, I think eventually what will happen is they will eventually sell to the Ricketts. They're not getting out of Bridgeview until 2029 where their stadium is because it's an ironclad lease for... And it, if there's an MLS team in Chicago, it has to be there till 2029. So it's not even like they could fold the team and then award a new expansion team and then put that in Lincoln Hills. Like, it just it doesn't work that way. But... I'm sorry. I know the Ricketts are, are beloved because they brought the Cubs a championship and the stadium renderings look amazing and the stadium's downtown. They're not going to get 20,000 people to go to a USL team. 
I'm sorry, it's not going to do... I, I don't think it's going to affect the, the fire drawing in meaningful ways How does all. Cincinnati do it then? With such a smaller market. And I realize that there will be two teams, you know, and one's a minor league team, but Cincinnati has the same minor league. It's the USL team, right? 40,000. Um, other teams that we've seen have drawn extremely well at the USL level. Why can't it happen maybe it's a market a much bigger market maybe it's a mar- maybe it's the dynamics of the market right like I know I know you'll jump at this but no. like everyone talks about you know like LA doesn't draw as well for a lot of its teams as other places it's got a million people there you know you know it's got millions upon millions of people I will jump on it because the Los Angeles Dodgers have led the league in attendance for like that's one, that's one team though I know but I just, out of them you know like I mean my, the, you're the, messing with my tone the char- the Chargers can't sell out the Galaxy Stadium the Chargers are a different thing that's not an LA team but That's you get a what San I'm Diego saying. Team. Now, now you're just trying to troll me. Yeah, but now you're going to talk about next. Come on, man. But now you're getting semantical, and that's the thing is, like, no, you're, you're not right. looking you're at every right. market All right. as the Go same. Ahead and and start. I'll let you talk. I'm if sorry, you, interrupt. If you. you look at Chicago in general, you know where were Blackhawk fans in the '90s? Where are Sox fans now? Where were Bulls fans? You know, this <laughs> forever this last that when Jordan isn't in there. Yeah, yeah. And, and even when um, Epstein started with the Cubs and they intentionally bottomed out. I could buy those tickets for ten dollars, yeah. and they stopped being sold out. So don't everyone loves to talk about what a great sports market Chicago is? It's a great market when your team is good, or if you're the Bears, or if you're the Bears, right. exactly. Um, they don't support Northwestern in anything. Uh, th- this isn't a market that just blindly goes to games for things. And the fire drew amazingly, and going to Bridgeview wasn't a problem. Was from 2006 to 2010 when they were really really good yeah then they got shitty for 10 years and nobody goes now that's 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 the fire's problem so it doesn't matter what the rickets do when bastion schweinsteiger came and they were good last year bridgeview sold out almost all its games after he arrived because people had a reason to go so if you're the fire don't worry about the usl team Worry about making your team good, yeah. and then people will come and people will. Why aren't the fire good? I don't know what we're at at, at, at this uh, this episode, but frankly, I don't care because I love the fire, and I want you to tell me why are the fire not good? We have a great coach who with a ton of success in in the international stage, right? He's obviously a smart dude. Is it the GM Nelson I, Rodriguez? Rodriguez, what's the deal? Is they just not willing to there's, throw money? There's no talent. He has. Why do we suck for so long, man? Because they made, they made, well, suck is relative, I guess. Like, we thought we sucked under Klopas because we were an average team and we weren't used to being an average team because we made the playoffs for every year of our existence except for, for one um, before 2010. I think 2000, yeah, 2009 we made the conference finals and then 2010 we missed. So so everyone would see us not make the playoffs on the last day of the season and be like, oh, they're, they're terrible because there was no perspective. So then we started rifling through people very quickly and giving them short terms and then turning the keys over to people like Frank Yallop, who the league had passed by years ahead of time. And we watched him torpedo us into Wooden Spoon area. Uh, I think twice he got us the Wooden Spoon, at least once. And then there was just nothing there. Um, I don't think that the owner is cheap, which if this was ever seen on the, the fire hashtag, everyone would start screaming at me because everyone likes to say he's cheap. I don't think he's cheap. I think he's just really bad at spending his his money and picking people to run it. I like Rodriguez for the most part. And we were, you know, in year two of his term, we were third place in the league and we returned to the playoffs. Now we got shelled in the playoffs, but he turned things around. Then this last winter came and we signed one guy who sounds like he was about our third choice being Alexander Katai, who seems like an okay player, but he's really inconsistent. And we don't even know if he'll be here in the summer, if they'll pick his option up. What it sounds like from everything you read is that Rodriguez has his evaluation of what a player is, and they're not willing to spend over what his evaluation of that player is. It's very Arson Wengery. And then he didn't his his evaluation didn't meet other people's evaluations. So we would go after these targets, and we'd be like, "We think you're worth this much money, and you should sign for us." And then another team would go, "Yeah, we think you're worth more." And guess what? The player doesn't come then mm-hmm. because they want to get paid, and I don't blame them. So at some point. You either have to find a different way to find talent rather than throwing your money at it. Like, you have to do a better job of developing your younger players. That's what I was going to say. Or... The the Fire have always had a great reputation of their their younger players. If you're not going to be able to go out and get free agents, you have to either build through the draft or build through the homegrown 
well, you know, procedures. Well, and and that may be where we are, but you know, the other option is, and what I think he needs to immediately do if he wants to have a long term future here is, you need to change your evaluations. All right, because if the entire market is telling you no, it might not just be that people are overpaying. It may be that you're undervaluating these guys. Now we're at a point now where we're starting five rookies a game. And some of them are showing some promise. Some of them aren't showing as much promise, but they're rookies. So they're real up and down and they make mistakes. And the problem is, is when we finally tasted success last year after not having it for so long, and we're tired of hearing about three-year plans because every time we get a new GM, they tell us it's a three-year plan. And guess what? This is year three of Rodriguez's three-year plan. You you are going to lose people when you say, well, now we're going to give these, these rookies a try. So it's kind of like, what do you do? Like if you blow it up maybe that's better for the long term but man now you're you're, you're really, really gonna, gonna clear the place there. out right yeah and nobody's gonna come to those games exactly or do you spend all this money and go after guys like either casillas and fernando torres who might make you good but where are we going to be in two years then when they're gone i mean if you look at our roster it's based our starting roster it's rookies and guys over 30 for the most part you know nicolich is over 30 schweinsteiger's over 30 um, McCarty is probably still in his 30. prime reign. Oh yeah, he is in his thirties. No, yeah. no, maybe twenty nine. I can't remember. He, he's I think upper, he's. Upper I think he's plus thirty. Yeah. I, I think he's plus thirty. So, you know, our our guys are getting, our guys that are good are getting too old, and our guys that are young are probably too young. So we're kind of stuck in this middle zone. So it'll, this summer window will be really really interesting. Like if they, it, it'll show what direction they're going. Like if they go spend a lot of money, then we know they're going to. A, try and attempt to win in this kind of Schweinsteiger Nikolic window that we have that's closing very quickly or they're just going to say screw it we got to start over and the summer window has been something Nelson has kind of scoffed at in the past though we did bring Delu in uh during a summer window but but you have to know if you to yeah if you only bring in one guy it's not Well the, the worry is is that we lost Delu and we lost Solonyak and we lost Mahalovic and my, my slight worry is he's just going to go, well, th- that'll be like our new signings. And as an Arsenal fan, I've, I heard that so many times where it's like, oh, this guy's <laughs> coming back like from injury. So Arsenal, that's our right? that's our new signing or whatever. And it's like, no, <laughs> we don't know how they're going to come back. You know, Deleuze over 30 as well. You know, so I would hope they have more of a plan because you can't you can't sell me Alan Gordon as a signing and want me to be excited. Uh, and and. And I have season tickets, and I just renewed my season tickets. But I don't know if there's a ton of people that are going to be willing to do that if they keep keep spinning the wheels like mm-hmm. we've been doing. Uh, what is, if you could build a team through the um, through the lens of another team, you know, what teams have, have built themselves up in a way that you think is, is the best? Like, is there a team out there that you respect? Well, there, there's a couple different models. It, it's hard to argue with what Atlanta has done, and that is to spend a ton of money to get young talent there to be telling them, we are your bridge from you know Paraguay, in Almiron's case, Argentina in Barco's case, to Europe. And they have just an insane amount of attack. I mean, watching you know, Joseph and, They're fun. and Barco and all those guys you know hook up together – Granted, every time I've seen them live, they've torn up my teams. But, man, it's enjoyable to watch them do it. I'm in awe of it. So there is something to be said. They they got some MLS veterans. They got Big Red, Lorenowitz yeah. in there, and Parkhurst and Guzan and some of these other guys that are experienced to kind of anchor those guys as well. So that's the ideal scenario. But, I mean, they're setting transfer records every window. That's probably not the case for them you would hope if the Ricketts end up do owning the team that that might be the case for Chicago the other model I think is Kansas City where they make DP signings but they make them in guys who are a little more under the radar you know you look at uh, Espinoza and and guys like that that they've been able to get runs out of or you know just developing your own guys and you're you know they have they own their own USL team and and running guys through your system they're the model that I think 90% of MLS teams are chasing because they've had prolonged success in multiple trophies under Peter Vermees without going and just spending tons and tons of money on whatever you can find. Um, I also have a ton of admiration for Jesse Marsh and the Red Bulls and, and what he's able to do. I think that'll be my saddest thing as a Fire fan is that we had a window where we were looking for a coach and we didn't hire Jesse Marsh, and we could have, and I think we would be much better for it, but... Um, you know, Dallas is another one. They, they, they run everything through their academy and 
they produce a lot of high quality talent. They have a big population pool down there in Texas. And we've seen a lot of great players come out of Texas, but you know, there's no reason that Illinois can't produce great players as well. So, and as you've said, they've been lauded for their Academy a lot, but we haven't necessarily seen those returns on the field. A long time. So hopefully, hopefully Lillard and Mahalovich, um, and guys like that are going to be the, the big ones that we remember for being Academy guys because they're the ones we got now. Speaking of big ones, this has been a big episode. I know for all you non-soccer fans, why are you still listening? Uh, <laughs> in any event, uh, thank you so much for listening. We are at Kids Seriously. if you want to reach out um, and hit us up on Twitter. If you want to email the show and get on the show uh, like Chris did today, at, or I'm sorry, uh, email us at uh, kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Luke, where can they find you? At Luke underscore Nitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L. And I'm at Maya Madrid. I hope you guys have a wonderful evening. We'll see you next week with solo stuff. Bye. <laughs>